All right, welcome back. This is Mr. Finneseth with AP Bio, and we're finishing up Chapter 26 here today, looking at Section 4 and 5, talking about um, phylogenetics and how we can uh, better organize this tree of life that we've been uh, discussing here in Chapter 26. Linnaeus got the whole thing started by trying to group organisms based on physical characteristics. And, of course, as we've gone through time, um, we've learned a lot more in terms of embryology and structural anatomy and, and of course, DNA being the biggie here. And in doing so, we have found that there's a lot of things that you have to take into account, not just the fossil record, not just physical characteristics, and not even just DNA. We're going to try and look at how everything fits together and again, a phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis on how things began. There are lots of different possibilities out there, but we're trying to get the best fit for the whole um, tree of life. So we start looking at nucleic acids and other molecules to determine how um, the evolutionary history of different organisms have come together. We're look and when we do that, um, it's interesting to note that DNA that codes for ribosomal RNA changes very, very slowly. We're talking about um, hundreds of millions of years before we see differences in that genetic code. Well, this is valuable to us when we're talking about common ancestors for the fungi and for the green plants because that divergence took place hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, in contrast, if you look at mitochondrial DNA, um, the changes in that genetic code happens much more rapidly. And so this allows us to analyze more recent events. In fact, researchers um, recently studying different Native American groups from South America, from Mexico, from Arizona, have come to the conclusion that they're all very closely related and are ancestors of a group that came across the Bering Strait uh, during the last great ice age 15,000 years ago. So this is extremely groundbreaking new stuff that um, is cutting edge with biology right now. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, we start examining DNA, there's some very distinct things that we have to keep in mind. Over time, there's been a lot of gene duplication. Uh, the number of genes in the genome have been copied, um, have been mutated, and these repeated gene duplications will result in gene families. And when we talk about um, homologous genes or duplicated genes, these give us uh, an indication of how we can attach a group of organisms to a particular common ancestor if there are matches in this um, process. This brings us to two very key terms in chapter 26, orthologous genes and paralogous genes. What an orthologous gene is, is uh, a group of genes that have at one time been the same gene with a common ancestor, but when a speciation event occurred, they separated and the two genes have been changing over time since that speciation event. Paralogous genes, on the other hand, um, are looking at gene duplication within a single species. So, for example, if we're talking human beings, um, human beings have two blood proteins. There's myoglobin and there's hemoglobin. Okay, they don't have the same function today. Myoglobin is an oxygen storage molecule in muscle whereas hemoglobin is an oxygen storage molecule in red blood cells. Their functions are similar, but they're not quite the same. And they are the result of gene duplication however many millions of years ago. Orthologous genes, though, on the other hand, if you go back and use the same example of hemoglobin, dogs have hemoglobin, human beings have hemoglobin, but obviously um, the genetic makeup of those genes are different in dogs and in humans, and this is, again, talking about the same thing. Here's an ancestor, speciation event occurs, and we get two separate organisms. Here's the, the dog gene for hemoglobin, 
here's the human gene for hemoglobin as an example. Um, the, the functions are the same, but the genetic code is slightly different. They've evolved uh, differently over time since separating from their common ancestor. Here is the human ancestral gene for um, uh, an oxygen carrying molecule, and over time we've created hemoglobin, and over time we've created myoglobin. Okay, so understand the difference between paralogous genes and orthologous genes. And this is, again, just talking about the example that I was uh, giving you in the previous slides. Okay, orthologous, paralogous when genes are duplicated, and one of the copies evolves a new function, like, say, for example, myoglobin. Okay, so those are two terms, again, that you should really know and understand when we're talking about um, this part of Chapter 26. Another part of this, as you're getting into the conversation on genome evolution, is the whole idea that um, these genes that persist in modern species, modern organisms today, have been extended over many, many, many generations. For example, humans and mice had a common ancestor about 65 million years ago. And our genes, as a consequence, are about 99% orthologous. Gene number and the complexity of the organism is not strongly linked, though. You, may keep, you have to keep that in mind because when you examine, if you compare humans and yeast, a single one-celled eukaryotic organism, we only have four times as many genes as a yeast organism. You would think, and it's understandable, that humans and chimps would have a lot of very similar um, number of genes because our common ancestor is much more recent. But you start examining humans and yeast, our common ancestor is hundreds of millions ago, billions of years ago, and you'd think that humans would have way more genes present in its genome than a yeast cell, simply because we are so far superior and complex in terms of metabolism, our organ systems, etc. You'd think there would be way more more genes than what you see. Um, as a result, though, um, over time, our genes have developed a great deal of versatility. So where one section of DNA can code for multiple things, there's a lot of overlap, gene for um, protein A, overlap with gene for protein B, overlap by gene for protein C. There's a lot more of that going on in the human genome than there is in the yeast genome. All right, finally, one of the last topics that we want to discuss here is molecular clocks and how um, we've been using molecular clocks to track evolutionary time. Now, if you go back to Section 3 and you think about maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood, these are things that we talked about um, previously in the chapter, they're, they're trying to give um, a validation for a hypothesis on a specific phylogenetic tree. And how they've come up with that is they've looked at DNA changes over time. Again, DNA kind of being the key thing here. And they use computers, um, very powerful computers, to grind out all these different scenarios as far as we have this group of organisms, what does the phylogenetic tree look like? Well, one of the main things they're going to start to examine is DNA changes over time. If there's the, the phylogenetic tree that shows the fewest mutations over time is probably the most likely sequence of evolutionary events. Again, if you go back to the example at the beginning of the chapter, they're talking about the relationship between mammals, fungi, and green plants. You would think on first inspection, when you look at a fungus, when you look at a plant, that the fungi is more closely related to that plant. And therefore, they should be grouped together. Um, but again, examining DNA, we have found that that's not the case, that the percent differences in DNA sequences puts mushrooms uh, branching off much more likely um, with mammals compared to a uh, further distant common ancestor with green plants.
again, uh, this would be another possibility, but as you look at this uh, example here, you can see that we're not getting a constant rate of evolutionary change. Maximum parsimony is talking about evolutionary change should be relatively constant. And that's where we get back to molecular clocks. When you examine uh, paralogous genes and orthologous genes, the, the basic premise is that a molecular clock is going to have a constant rate of evolution. In other words, some genes mutate at a constant rate. <clears throat> These molecular clocks then, once you start examining that, they're calibrated against the fossil record. And what they found is that these individual genes that we've been studying over an extended period of time are basically showing us that they do have a constant rate of change. And it does match the fossil record. That's what's really kind of exciting about this whole premise of, mo of molecular clocks. Now, um, once we started understanding this, there was a group of scientists that came up with neutral theory. And what neutral theory states is that much of evolutionary change in genes, our molecular clocks and the proteins that they produce, have no effect on the fitness of the organism and therefore not influenced by natural selection. What they're saying is that a lot of these mutations that are taking place are harmless mutations. Um, you know, we've substituted an A for a T or a C for an A, and in doing so, it really didn't affect the protein that was being produced. And the reason why they felt that neutral theory was a, a good idea is the fact that if a gene mutated and it produced a very harmful effect for that um, genetic change, then the fitness of that organism would plummet and it probably wouldn't survive to pass on that uh, mutated gene anyway. Now, are molecular clocks perfect? Uh, definitely not. There's been a lot of problems in terms of examining these genes and trying to match them up with the fossil record. It definitely does not run as smoothly as neutral theory would like it to proceed. There are a number of different irregularities that result from natural selection and let's face it, if there is a mutation that gives a favorable gene sequence, a sequence of DNA that is going to give a positive effect, natural selection is going to favor that sequence over other mutations that maybe are not favorable or neutral. Natural selection will have an impact on this whole process. So estimates of evolutionary divergence older than the fossil record we still um, have a lot of uncertainty. One thing to take one gene and examine that gene over time and look at the number of mutations and you know um, talk about its um, fitness and talk about it in terms of a molecular clock. But what if we use multiple genes? Now granted, some genes are going to mutate and change faster than others. It depends on the type of gene and what it's coding for. But it, if the more genes that we lump together, the greater the possibility that we're going to get a good average time of evolutionary change. Uh, a good example of this was the HIV example that the book um, gives in chapter 26. They start to uh, examine samples of HIV from very recent times and compare it to samples of HIV from the 80s when it first really became you know, um, a serious outbreak around the world uh, compared to samples from the 60s. And of course, the, the genome of the HIV virus has changed over time. It does uh, mutate very rapidly, which is one of the problems with treating HIV. And, and in doing this and examining uh, the molecular clock, so to speak, they're trying to figure out at what point HIV spread to the human race from chimpanzees. Examining these samples of HIV showed us that the virus has evolved in a very clock-like way. And when we um, apply this molecular clock to one strain of HIV, that strain seems to date back to the 1930s. So if we draw a best, so if we draw a best fit line from this data and extrapolate backwards, the, the thought is that somewhere around the 1930s is probably when this virus made its jump from chimps to the human population. So, 
So this wraps up chapter 26 and good luck on the quiz.